through last here we go through last year and started to do analysis. Um, we were brought on board just a couple of weeks ago in December to put the transportation uh, planning uh, process into the context of planning for the university as a whole. Um, you'll see there has been uh, stakeholder consultation or public involvement all the way through the process beginning uh, back at the end of, uh, of 2013. Uh, importantly, there was a survey, a web survey distributed uh, in March, and you'll see some of the results uh, from, from that survey. We've, we've paid a lot of attention to it. Um, this is the uh, January public meeting. We'll be coming back in, uh, in March for a second meeting to talk about uh, our preliminary recommendations to get more input and to really start to, to talk about solutions. What you're going to see today is really just an overview, what we've, what we've learned uh, uh, using the, the uh, previous consultant's work uh, uh, and what we've uh, sort of developed as a, uh, as a starting point for our analysis. The, uh, the, the working group that is uh, leading this process within the university has developed a set of, uh, as I said, draft guidelines um, that, uh, that uh, we want to, uh, to, to take into account. Uh, uh, these are uh, principles uh, expressing the, uh, the larger purpose and the role of transportation uh, on the campus. Um, obviously, enhancing campus mobility and access, uh, an important part of that is supporting a pedestrian focus in the campus core, enhancing bicycle access, and eliminating mobility barriers. Um, you're not going to see uh, much or anything specifically about the issue of accessibility on campus because it's a very high level uh, discussion, but uh, we, we do know, we have heard very clearly that uh, accessibility and disabled access is a very important issue here and we will be, uh, we'll be digging into it deeply. Um, promoting safety. Uh, obviously, that's, that's really the first, that should be the first principle in any transportation planning, particularly on a college campus where pedestrians and, uh, and vehicular traffic are interacting. Fostering environmental sustainability. Um, uh, transportation, as you know, uh, has environmental impacts, and we're uh, very concerned both uh, for the, the good of the campus community and for the, uh, the environment as a whole uh, to minimize the, uh, the carbon footprint of the campus and specifically of the transportation system. Uh, Right-sizing parking supply and allocation, uh, which is a way of saying that uh, we need to achieve a balance between supply and demand. We need to figure out through uh, parking provision, through location, through allocation and assignment, and through pricing, how to give people the options that they need uh, to make their, uh, their commuting and their moving around campus uh, work for them. Uh, accommodating campus growth and transformation. As I said, we're, we're working this effort into the uh, discussion of the, the campus's overall master plan and uh, physical development. And finally, assuring financial self-sufficiency, um, which is to say that uh, nothing is free. And, uh, we need to at least understand what, the, uh, what it costs to run the transportation system and decide how to pay for it. Okay, now starting with the sort of regional overview, here's uh, some information taken from the campus survey. That is, this is just based on people's responses when we ask them, uh, where do you live and where do you come from on a daily basis? Um, uh, this is looking at the student population. As you can see, it's uh, fairly, uh, uh, students live in a fairly compact area uh, within uh, New Circle Drive and, and Man of War Boulevard. Um, and uh, that population is pretty well served by the Lextran system. Uh, uh, there's more to be said about that, and, and we will. Um, now, when you look at the employee distribution, you can see they come from a much wider uh, uh, area uh, that's not so well served or so accessible um, by bus. 
When you look at the regional bicycle network, um, this comes from the city's bike plan. Um, the city is working very hard on bikes. There's a lot of gaps in this system, as you can see, but you can also see, well, maybe you can't too well. There's a lot of dotted lines here, the proposed trails. Um, and uh, those will go a long way to creating a, a safe and uh, pleasant and attractive uh, usable regional bicycle system. Um, now, zooming in on the campus. The campus has a number of, of sort of distinct neighborhoods that really condition people's need to move across campus. So we'll be, we'll be using these zones uh, for reference uh, as we go through. Um, starting with the walks and paths in yellow there, you can see um, that, that uh, uh, the, the location and, and uh, denseness of, of uh, pedestrian paths really um, indicates the structure of the campus. Um, but when you overlay the streets on that, you, you, you see that uh, you see how the streets really uh, cut the campus up into, into large zones. The academic area is sort of cut off by, by, by Rose Street. The library area, Hilltop and Woodland, sort of cut off the uh, South Campus uh, residential area. Um, so that's, that's a fact of life. And uh, it's important to understand that the uh, university doesn't own or control all of those streets. The streets you see in red are owned by the city. So we'll be needing to cooperate with them on on any important changes that we make here. Now, uh, the, the, this overlay and, and talking to a lot of people and, and uh, spending a lot of time on the campus uh, uh, gives us a, a sense of what some of the, the, uh, the hot spots for pedestrian vehicular conflicts are. Um, obviously, Rose Street is one. Um, the pedestrian paths from Kerwin Blandings and Woodland Glen uh, have to be improved. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of pedestrian vehicular conflicts along uh, Hilltop and, and Woodland. Um, limestone, upper confluence here is a, a famous mess. And I um, don't know how much we'll be able to do about it. Um, a lot of what happens there depends on what happens uh, long term with the extension of the Newtown Pike, uh, which would connect to Scott Street. And uh, uh, limestone at the medical center is, uh, uh, is a, a difficult place to cross, even with the bridges. And I'd also add there are issues about uh, Euclid, uh, especially as the, uh, the North Campus housing is developed. So looking at the bicycle network, um, as with the city, uh, there, there's, uh, there's more to be done. But the, city, the, uh, the university's been working very hard to improve bike uh, connectivity and to address some of the gaps. Uh, for instance, there will be a, uh, an extension of this off-street uh, path, a uh, parallel uh, multi-use path along Alumni Drive. And uh, as evidence of the university's uh, uh, efforts, uh, UK was recently recognized uh, with a bike-friendly university silver status by the, uh, by the League of American Bicyclists. So that, that, that's an important, an important uh, milestone. Um, all of this movement takes place within the, the, the open space framework. And uh, uh, this is really important because the environment that people move through really, really uh, to a great degree determines their experience uh, of that movement, particularly walking. And the, the, uh, the nicer a walk is, the shorter it feels. And uh, um, uh, I'm not just saying that. That's really uh, been, uh, been proven, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll all You'll all uh, recognize it from your own experience. Um, now, looking at, at how people move around the campus, first starting with, with some big, big facts. The uh, uh, resident student population is about 7,000. Commuter student, about 26,000. So uh, um, about 33,000 total students on campus. Interestingly, the uh, resident students have parking permits at a higher rate per capita than commuting students, uh, uh, which is, has, has a number of implications that we could come back to. Uh, faculty and staff is about 13,000, and uh, a much higher percentage of them, uh, understandably, have uh, parking permits. Um, when you look at, 
how people get to and from campus, or the, the, the mode split, as we call it. Um, among commuter students, about half drive, about a quarter walk, uh, about 8% take uh, Lextran, and about 4% bicycle. Um, looking at the, the bottom graph, this, is a, this represents, again, from survey data, uh, from, from what people volunteered about their, their commuting uh, habits. Um, you can see students sort of come and go uh, uh, all day long. Um, the the, the uh, maximum occupancy of students probably is right around 11.30 when people are still coming in, but nobody started to leave yet. Right about then, some people start to depart. Others are still coming. So this period is sort of the maximum occupancy. But this is about traffic, not about not population. That's why it goes up and down. This is just number of cars coming and, and leaving from the campus. Um, when you look at uh, where students live uh, on campus, you can, you can see the, uh, the three really major uh, uh, residential zones. There's going to be a lot of new housing in the north campus, uh, in uh, Woodland Glen and the Kerwin Blandings area. Um, uh, with, with Hagen 1 and 2. There's going to be a lot of new beds. There's also going to be a lot taken offline. Um, these numbers are kind of a moving target, um, uh, the future beds, but it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good indication of, of where students uh, are located residentially. Uh, in terms of academics, this is intended to show where students are at the peak hour in classrooms. There's a lot of ways to measure this. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, is kind of rough, but obviously the academic core is where people are, are uh, congregated during the day. Uh, when you look at uh, the same picture for employees, you see, first of all, um, much higher percentage of, uh, of employees driving uh, alone, single occupant vehicles, uh, and a smattering using other modes. Uh, on, the, uh, on the traffic arrival and departure uh, graph, you can see because, obviously, employees work eight hours or, or longer every day, uh, they, they uh, come and go more or less during the peak hours. Um, one thing that, that uh, uh, this does indicate is that in terms of traffic and just the, the, the people, cars on the streets uh, in and around the campus, there might be some, uh, uh, some value in looking at, at, at some staggered shifts and seeing if you can spread those, those peaks out and possibly uh, reduce the congestion that you see, uh, you know, you'll see on Hugelet and, and University and, and Rose in sort of, uh, sort of the mid-afternoon. Um, when you look at the employee population, where they're located during the day, um, obviously the academic core is a big one, but the, uh, the, the medical center uh, is the largest. This, uh, uh, we believe, is, is a, a measure of uh, full-time equivalent uh, population. Obviously, it also, it, it, the health center employs people round the clock, so that, that in, uh, inflates that number. Um, so kind of looking at this uh, more broadly, looking at primary points of origin, where people uh, are, are coming from and where they're going to, um, these start to give you a sense of sort of the, the migratory patterns of, uh, of uh, people across the campus. Um, this is an impressionistic drawing, and it probably leaves out some things. Um, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of people uh, on this, this path between uh, the Anderson Tower and the business school. That's very heavily used. But this just sort of is, is to, to give a sense of, of uh, the, the flows of, of uh, people, both pedestrians and cars around the campus. Mostly pedestrians, though. This is about how people move from one point to another. But you can see the importance of the university Avenue corridor and all of this. Um, okay, a couple of big uh, facts about the parking and the transit systems. Uh, this is the parking map, um, distinguishing lots, garages, uh, on-street parking, and parking areas, which are sort of uh, paved but uh, less formal uh, spaces, uh, sort of uh, sprinkled throughout the campus. 36% of the uh, of the campus parking is in garages, uh, so those major garages are an important uh, element of the, of the system on their own. Um, another way of looking at the capacity is how, how the, the spaces are assigned. Um, 
uh, what should I say about this? I guess, uh, obviously, the stadium parking is uh, really the big, the big uh, parking resource for the whole campus. That and the, uh, uh, the lots across university at the Ag School. Um, we can come back to all of this in question and answer. I'm just going to try to move through it. Um, the campus at the same time is served by these Lex, Lextran and Katz routes. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that the, the routes as they're structured now tend to be loop routes. And uh, we're looking at uh, whether there's, there's opportunities to make the routes more user friendly and to increase ridership by making them more point to point so that people don't have to, have to go around three quarters of the campus sometimes to get to their, uh, their destination by bus. Speaking of uh, ridership and service, um, this is just, again, some of the basic facts. Um, the service is, is, is uh, all Monday to Friday and, uh, and, and doesn't go too late into the evening, so there's not a lot of off-peak off, uh, uh, service. Um, headways are uh, mostly about 15 minutes, uh, which is not bad. It would be good if we could get them down to 10, but uh, we'll come back to, to uh, some, some survey results about people's experience with waiting for the bus. Uh, on the ridership side, you see that there, there are buses that are really not that well used. Uh, and uh, to me, that doesn't indicate that these are routes that shouldn't be running. It indicates that we need to find ways to make the buses more useful to people and to increase ridership through scheduling and through route structure. Uh, um, the location of bus stops is an important part of the route structure. And, and, um, this map is just something that, that we put together that, that reveals uh, that, that the, uh, the stops are maybe, in general, a little too closely spaced. Uh, it might be impossible to make the, the system work more efficiently if, the, space is, if the, the stops were spaced maybe uh, a little further apart. What you see, the circles are two-minute walk circles. So we'd like to, uh, to spread those out a little and just make sure that the campus is still covered um, but not have so much, uh, so much duplication and, and, and maybe unnecessary stops. Um, okay, going back to parking, here's how uh, spaces are designated during the day. You'll see there the, the, the employee commuter uh, uh, spaces are an important component, and there, there are uh, um, quite a few of those. In the evening, you've got this sort of any valid permit uh, uh, category that makes parking much more available. Um, now, I'm going to take you sort of slowly through, through these next slides because they're, they, they're kind of dense. But what this does is compares the number of people who are uh, sort of based in each of the, the neighborhoods uh, with the number of parking spaces that are there. Now, the, the people are represented by parking permits. How many people with permits are in each of those zones, and how many parking spaces are there. So for instance, in zone one, there are 908 total spaces, including some reserved, and there are 572 people who either, are, uh, either live there or have their classroom, uh, their, their, their peak hours or classroom presence in that zone. Um, so that, that might be considered a, uh, a, an area that has a, uh, a parking uh, surplus. Now remember, this is just the employee side. That this, this will be, so I'm sorry, I got it wrong. I didn't mean to say students living. This is all about employees, people who are, uh, uh, who have their offices or main locations in those zones. We'll come to the, the student side of this. So for instance, if you look at zone two, the academic core, um, there's more permits than there are spaces for employees. Um, again, we can come back to these numbers. Okay, here's the student side. Um, this is people who are either living in a zone or whose peak hour class is in that zone. And the big story here, obviously, is that students are mostly uh, uh, supposed to park in the stadium lots. Now, um, what we have to do here, the whole challenge of this plan, is to connect parking with destinations. And that's where transit and improving walking conditions and bicycling 
conditions comes in. Um, uh, here's the resident side. Uh, similar story. Now, about actual occupancy, how many people show up at parking lots, how many cars can we count? Uh, this count was taken by, by Walker Associates uh, uh, last year, and we've updated it a little bit. Um, but uh, I have to say, this, this is, a, is a telling slide. It shows that uh, you do not have a lot of surplus parking campus-wide. Um, you wouldn't see this at most, most universities, most state flagship campus universities will have uh, much more available parking in those peripheral lots. So um, uh, we, uh, we certainly recognize that you are uh, very parking constrained here. So while we'll be talking a lot about transportation demand management and walking and biking and getting everybody out of their cars, uh, please understand that we, we uh, acknowledge the shortage of parking here and we'll be looking for ways to increase supply. Now, that's going to be subject to uh, constraints placed on the university by, uh, by finances generally, by the legislature in particular. Um, but uh, uh, clearly, it's, it's an important issue for the transportation plan. Now, just looking at how parking is allocated and priced, costs $264 per year, uh, no matter where you park or what kind of uh, uh, student you are, resident or commuter. Um, and uh, that's also something that uh, needs to be looked at. There are other systems. Uh, I understand that, uh, uh, well, let's first go to the employee side. Similar, similar picture, except that there's also an availability uh, of a, a certain level of reserved and premium reserved spaces. Um, but basically, a basic employee permit costs $396 a year. Um, there was a time when the university distinguished between professional and hourly uh, uh, personnel in pricing and allocating permits. Uh, they went away from that in, uh, in the 90s. Um, there's other ways to do it. You can, you can take into account seniority, uh, um, hours of work, and uh, you can also uh, make the parking somewhat more uh, market uh, sensitive by creating categories of parking, charging more for, um, for uh, more convenient parking. Um, so now, that's sort of the existing condition. We, I, I just showed a couple of things about the uh, 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 new projects, but uh, we'll go into that a little further. Um, there are a number of things that are going, coming down the, down the pike that are going to increase parking demand. There will be an increase in, in uh, enrollment and, and uh, employment, a major increase, obviously, in the number of students living on campus. And as, as I showed, the uh, kids who live on campus uh, have cars at a higher rate than commuters. The growth of the medical center. Um, the only things that we can do to de decrease parking demand uh, will be in the, the realm of transportation demand management. So just to get a little further into that, Here's the projected growth in the student population. This is just based on a, a, uh, an, a, an assumption of sort of an annual average rate. But um, it's quite likely that the uh, um, uh, total enrollment will increase by about 10% over the next uh, uh, five years or so. Employee population is projected to increase at a slightly lower rate, more like 8% over those same uh, uh, years till 2020. Um, the on-campus housing, um, there's going to be a lot of new beds, obviously, uh, and a lot coming offline. So um, uh, like I said, uh, the, the total number is, is still uh, to be determined, but there's, uh, there, there are, there's definitely going to be a big increase in on-campus housing. OK, so where does that bring us? Issues and opportunities. Um, as I said, we uh, uh, have been listening. We're here to listen. Um, but uh, we want to talk about what the uh, sort of tools in our, in, our, in our chest are. We need to serve a whole variety of people uh, who use and, and live on and, and, and love the campus. Um, and those folks we're calling customers. And then we have these, these uh, uh, elements of the system 
to work with, the pathways, the transit system, and parking. And those are all, as, as uh, Eric said, those are all on the table. And, uh, and, and we want to hear your, your thoughts about all of them. We have heard a lot of thoughts already. We've been getting uh, uh, comments uh, by email uh, and, and through the, uh, the uh, EVPFA website, which I'll talk more about at the end. Um, <clears throat> people have told us that they have trouble finding parking, getting in and out of parking, um, uh, finding safe parking, uh, that uh, bicyclists uh, are, uh, I'm sure, uh, perceived as, as, uh, as hazardous in some, uh, some situations. We need to, uh, just briefly on bicycles, you know, I think we all agree bikes are a great thing. They're the, they're the best uh, form of transportation devised by man. Uh, we need to encourage it. At the same time, we need to be really careful to, to uh, take seriously the complaints of pedestrians and the concerns uh, uh, for safety that pedestrians have about bicycles. The real problems, traffic problems with bikes are not bicycle vehicular, they're bicycle pedestrian. And we, we will be, uh, we'll be uh, very alert to that. Um, so uh, we've heard about specific locations that people uh, want or need parking. Um, and as you can see, I'm not going to be talking a lot about specific cases uh, uh, today, but, uh, but you all are more than welcome to. Um, now, about how people uh, find the transit service. This is from the, from the, the campus survey. And uh, I'm sure you all have, have your own uh, experience with this. But from the survey, we found that almost two-thirds of the folks who catch buses at the stadium get them within five minutes. And that's pretty good. So uh, uh, let's, let's try and build on that. Um, so more broadly, um, we need to think about the transportation system, both in terms of supply, parking, roadways, bike paths, uh, um, walkways, demand, uh, which is uh, allocation and management and pricing of parking, the provision of, of uh, transportation, uh, transit services and, and their ability to uh, reduce demand for parking. And finally, land use, uh, uh, which is, as you can see, sort of our perspective on, on all of this as consultants, as, as land use consultants, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. So uh, we want to make sure that, that as the university moves forward, the, uh, the, the lessons of the transportation plan are, are, are digested uh, when you're thinking about where to put new buildings and how to, how to co-locate uh, facilities to reduce people's need to, uh, uh, to travel any more than, than they have to. Um, another important little diagram here is uh, uh, sort of one of the, the, the mantras of the parking industry. You can have inexpensive parking. You can have convenient parking. You can have enough parking. You can have any two of those, but you can't have all three. If you're going to have convenient, plenty of parking, it's going to cost money. If you're going to have inexpensive, convenient parking, there may not be enough of it. If you're going to have inexpensive and plenty of parking, it may not be that convenient. That's just the way of the world. It's, it's the physical, the physical uh, realities of uh, not just a college campus, but uh, uh, the real world. Um, finally, I want to talk a little about uh, some of the sort of physical uh, infrastructure components uh, of the, the, the uh, transportation master plan. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on, obviously, on the campus now that affect roadways. And we want uh, the transportation plan to really advance the agenda of the transportation, uh, uh, the traffic management uh, on campus. So um, first of all, you'll see. This is a great new thing. The Cooperstown Loop is going to be, uh, uh, this is, used to be Cooperstown Drive, uh, uh, which, uh, if you've been back there, is now kind of a squirrely little, little uh, linear parking lot that goes around the back of, of the old Cooperstown housing. In connection with the Woodland Glen redevelopment, um, Cooperstown Loop will become a real uh, road with, with uh, uh, capacity to carry traffic around the core of the campus. 
um, via um, Sports Center Drive from alumni, via university over to, to Cooper Drive and around here. The idea is to finally make it possible to get from you know, south on Limestone or Nicholasville over to Euclid without having to go up Limestone and over uh, on Avenue of Champions to go through this big mess here. We're not trying to solve a big regional transportation problem, but in terms of campus circulation, what that does is it takes pressure off of the core, off of Rose Street and Hilltop. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's going to be uh, a, a big improvement, and I, I urge you all to try that road out uh, in a year or so when it's built. Um, what comes out of that is the opportunity to improve those pedestrian conditions I, I mentioned at Woodland Glen and uh, coming over from Kerwin Blandings and along uh, the new, the new uh, dormitories that are being built on, uh, on Hilltop. Um, and to do something new and different with Rose. Um, we have not decided by any means uh, what is supposed to happen there. The master plan left it open. Uh, but this is our chance to really think that through and come up with the best solution. You might want to close it and make it a pedestrian way. You might want to leave it open and kind of live with it the way it is. We talked in the master plan about traffic calming as, uh, as, as an alternative. The fact is the traffic is about as calm out there as you can get it. You've got narrow uh, lanes, you've got crosswalks, you've got the, uh, the center median. Those could all be enhanced, but in terms of sort of physical dimensions, that's, that's as calm as you can make that street. And by calm, I mean angry, um, because <laughs> you can see what the result is. The problem on, on, uh, on uh, rows is not speed, it's volume. So we've, uh, if we're going to leave it the way it is, we're going to have to live with that pedestrian conflict. But there's also uh, a variety of, uh, of uh, intermediate measures. It might be possible to close it to general traffic uh, and leave it as a bus corridor. We understand that the parking on Funkhauser uh, Drive and, and Library Drive there are, are very uh, valuable, particularly as disability uh, parking. Uh, and we, we don't have any, any uh, uh, agenda to remove that parking. Uh, so maybe what you have is a street that's closed to general traffic but open to people with specific permits for those, uh, those lots and to buses. There's a lot of things we can do, both in design and management. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Euclid, uh, or Avenue of Champions, uh, with, especially with the new housing at North Campus, the crossings of uh, Euclid have to be improved. We've already uh, worked on that. By the way, I, I didn't mention, we are also doing a landscape master plan uh, for the university that will fold into all of this. And in that context, we've looked at the crossings of Euclid. Uh, finally, there's the limestone upper uh, Scott Street uh, confluence. Um, and uh, we would love to do something that, that can, uh, can improve that, that environment for pedestrians. As I said, it's, it's part of a, a larger context. There's the Newtown Pike. There's been talk about making limestone an upper two-way, at least in some portions. That's all um, at the city level. So we will be working with the city to see what we can do to, uh, to improve that, just because it's, it's, it's got to be improved. Um, so summary observations. Um, the great, great campus. Um, it's one of these classic uh, uh, flagship state university campuses, uh, been around for, for a long, long time, has great bones. We think through the transportation plan, um, those, those uh, uh, great areas can be extended across rows, past the library to Woodland Glen, that that, that whole sort of center of campus uh, it can be a, a, a much more uh, wonderful environment. You know, a campus is really a special place. Um, I know that it, it entails uh, parking inconvenience because you can't park everybody whose destination is in the core of campus right by their, by their buildings. You wouldn't have a college campus anymore. So we have to work really hard to uh, preserve the, the, the qualities that make this a great place to be, to live, to learn, a safe place, 
and, uh, and a healthy place, uh, one that encourages people to get out and about. And um, so, you know, we're, we're, not going, we're, we're not going to, uh, to back down on the point that the, uh, the basic model of having parking at the periphery of campus makes a lot of sense. You've just got to make it work with uh, transit and uh, improved uh, pedestrian conditions. Um, that said, you need more parking. Parking is at a premium, and we will uh, be finding ways to reduce that, uh, that crunch that uh, I showed in the occupancy slide. Um, transit is about moving people from that, that adequate reserve of parking to their destinations uh, quickly and, uh, uh, and, and uh, pleasantly. Um, talking about permit fees, uh, as I said, you, you might want to look at ways to sort of refine and, and, and make the parking system uh, more responsive to people's actual needs and perhaps resources. But um, the, uh, if, there's, if there's an element of the market that, that can be usefully introduced to sort of allocate and, and uh, make, uh, give people more choices, then we will certainly look into that. Um, the CAT system uh, does cover the campus well, um, but we need to find ways to, to make it more useful to more people um, through uh, modifying its route structure, routes and stops, scheduling, all of that. Um, and I guess, you know, just, to, just to, to beat a dead horse here, the balance has to be struck between convenient auto access and the preservation of this great campus that you have. And uh, so the bottom line is parking and transit have to work together to get people uh, from home to their destinations uh, quickly and efficiently. And with that in mind, I think that one way to maybe start this conversation is for me to suggest that we need to have a discussion and, and some sort of common understanding about what we expect both from the transportation system and from the people who use it. And so I'm going to just throw these, these up on the, on the screen uh, uh, to, to get people thinking. These are not guidelines. They're not our recommendations. They're not national standards. But they are uh, a way to think about how people relate to the campus and the transportation system. First of all, people should be able to walk 10 minutes. Uh, uh, that covers, that should be able to get people between classes. Um, it doesn't get you from one side of campus to the other necessarily, although uh, it's really about a 20 minute walk uh, from, say, the, the far end of the stadium parking to, uh, to here in, uh, in, the, in the student center. Um, bus stops should be located within a two minute walk of, of, of anywhere. As I showed on that, that uh, previous slide, that they certainly do that now. The campus is well covered, but we want to make sure that if you want to take the bus, you, you don't have to walk more than two minutes to get to one. Um, in terms of headways, 15 minutes is, uh, um, I'd, I'd say, the max. You wouldn't want to go any longer than that. Like I said, if we can find the resources and do a, a route structure that will allow us to bring that down to 10 minutes, I think that would make a big uh, difference to people. And here's, a, here's just sort of a, a shot in the dark. What if we say that our goal will be to ensure that from the moment you enter the campus, by car or on foot or bus, um, it shouldn't take you more than 20 minutes to get where you're going. That is, to get to the parking lot, get parked, wait for the bus, get on a bus, get off the bus, and walk to where you're going. Um, that's, that's, I think, a reasonable and fairly ambitious standard. And finally, I haven't said anything really about uh, disabilities here, but uh, as I said, it, it's, it's very important, and, uh, and we have to keep it uh, uppermost in our minds. Now, I'm going to open this to questions now. Um, so please, uh, uh, we, are, we are live streaming this presentation, so I'm going to have to ask you to come up to the microphones and speak into them so that they can be broadcast. Um, but this is not your only chance to comment. Um, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, EVPFA website and click on Transportation Plan, it's right there in the middle of the screen, there will be an opportunity to uh, submit comments and that's where we uh, uh, have already gotten the number that you saw 
on some of those previous slides. So with that, unless I've left anything out uh, from the team, I will open things up to questions. I know everybody's got something to say. So uh, let's hear it. So everything's great. OK. <laughs> Uh, yes, we do have a question. All right. Um, uh, can, we, can we get a microphone over there? Should I go over with, with my microphone? I'm going to come over and you can speak into my tie. <laughs> yeah, that's probably even. Well, is this uh, wireless? I'll take it off the top. Perfect. Okay. And by the way, I'm not going to be taking notes here, so don't think that, I, that uh, I'm not listening. Uh, other people are taking notes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Duke Pett. I'm with the Disability Resource Center here uh, at University of Kentucky. And um, I know you didn't go a lot over with, uh, with uh, disability access and things like that, but I've been here for four years, and I've noticed uh, that parking has come down quite a bit, you know, with the new structures being erected for students coming in and everything. And uh, disability resource or disability parking was at a premium then. It's become more of a premium now. Um, and I use a ramp van, and you know, parking is pretty tight for me. And you have to have to be pretty uh, aware of what's going on. I have to get on campus relatively early to get, you know, a spot. But um, in your master plan, what exactly do you have in mind, or what have you considered of increasing accessibility parking for persons with uh, uh, pretty extreme mobility impairments? Well, I, I think the short answer is we'll do whatever needs to be done. Uh, we have heard from, from uh, both from your office and from, from uh, um, individuals uh, so, some of the problems that you, that you mentioned. Um, and it, it could be that a, a fairly minor sort of reallocation of existing parking will, will uh, make a big difference. We also talked in the master plan about improving transit access for folks with disability which would mean uh, uh, accessible buses at the stadium lots, and then not just dropping people off at uh, uh, random stops, but uh, making sure that they are delivered to the highest point on campus so that, so that it's, uh, they don't have to, have to honk it up the hill. Um, so those are, those are sort of our two, our two uh, approaches to this now, but we want to work uh, specifically with, with you uh, as we go through this process to, to make sure we get it right. If you want to speak, you'll have to come down to the microphone. My name is Elena Black. I have a question. You talk about transportation. Okay, it's uh, like several of us that don't drive. And we was taking the cab service that was run by Lextran. That is going to end Friday. So that's no longer going to be in service for the ones that work from 3.30 in the morning and 5.30 in the morning. So is at this meeting, is that, are y'all going to be able to find us a way to get to work at that, type, at that time of morning. It's just not for us. I mean, I had to come to the meeting to see. Yeah, well, we're going to be meeting with Lextran, um, and we certainly will bring that up. Um, I, I suppose we'll have to see how things shake out. I mean, at, at some level, uh, the, the university uh, has to work with the public agencies and, and lobby them to, to provide the services that... Uh, that people need uh, beyond the, the uh, borders of the campus. But I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I have several questions. Um, one, you know, to echo what he said about disability, I think access is a real problem. Um, distributed access so people don't have to, you know, you can't put all of the uh, disability parking in one spot. Um, it's by law, it's supposed to be 
close to the buildings that it's serving. So that's, that's one issue. Um, I get a little nervous when you talk about uh, market-driven parking because the workers here who have the lowest salaries and the least flexibility with their schedules, and a lot of them have more than one job, and when you start pushing things out, um, then they can't get from one job to their other job uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And like that woman said, those who get here early to support the rest of the campus um, really have very few options. Um, and then my third common or question is about the conflict zone by the library and the new 90s building and the dorms that are up there. And yet there are several parking garages that kind of people have to go through there. The, the, yeah. And um, you know, the veterans, garage, the one over by the sports complex, and the, the other one by the Ag College. And so how do you get people into those garages when you make that a pedestrian zone? OK. Um, well, with regard, with regard to uh, permit pricing and the, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of market element, um, I, I, I really understand. Uh, that any time you introduce uh, a, a, a tiered system and make some spaces cost more than, than others, um, uh, you are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're making it harder for people who uh, 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 don't make as much money to get the parking that they want. And we're going to be very careful about that. I think the, uh, uh, the value uh, of a, uh, a more differentiated system is and should be just to give people more options. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that you won't have to pay more than you would like or than you, than you can afford for uh, convenient parking, but we want to make it so that you always have an option, a usable and, and functional and acceptable option that's affordable. Uh, so so uh, I think it's really what we'll be investigating is just all the different ways you could slice it and how you could, uh, um, what, what uh, one of the charges we were given when we were brought on is that we have to really fine tune the, uh, the permit structure and pricing uh, and get it right. So uh, that'll be something that we will be uh, working very hard on. And we probably will uh, not, uh, it, what, what we recommend is not going to be cast in concrete, uh, but we'll set up a, uh, a a structure that we hope will be flexible uh, as time goes on and adjustable so that, so that it can be fine-tuned and, and really give people, everybody, a good choice. Um, and uh, finally, on the uh, parking garage access question, I really, uh, uh, Lance will know, uh, um, one of the first things I said when we came in working on the master plan a few years ago is, can we just blow up the Rose Garage? Because <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but it, it, it draws traffic into, into the, the core of the campus. What we are working on, and uh, I guess I, I can go back to this, uh, is, to, is to try as best we can to make the garages you're talking about accessible from the periphery without having to go through the core of campus. And that's really the best we can do. So that does mean making use of university uh, to, get, to get folks up, uh, up to the Rose Garage. And, um, and this section of, uh, of Hilltop will always have to remain open. Um, but if we can get it so that people are coming into the garages from the edges and not having to drive through the campus, that's really, uh, I think, uh, a, a big accomplishment. Anyone else? Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, or maybe it's for UK parking and transportation as well, but just um, thinking about, so there's 30,000 students, give or take more, whatever, um, that pay nearly $300 each for a parking pass, and there's 13,000 employees that are paying nearly $400 each for a parking pass. But there aren't, I, I didn't notice you talking about, it was all pushed to the periphery and no, no specific implementation of like building new structures. 
I mean, that's like millions of dollars. Where, where does that money go? I know, it sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? Well, um, parking garages cost a lot to build and maintain. Uh, the the uh, 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 transportation and parking uh, office is responsible for running transit and for uh, uh, running the, uh, uh, for they, they employ a lot of people too. Um, the short story is that there's, there's not a lot of money just sitting, sitting around unused. Um, and uh, I guess what I should say is that, uh, again, we are looking for ways to increase the parking supply. We've got to find ways to pay for it. Um, and uh, maybe Lance is going to add to that. So I'll save Andy a little bit. My name is Lance Brokey. I'm Director of Parking Transportation Services. I'll just take this off. Um, our budget is $11 million a year. And I can essentially say that, um, I don't know the exact numbers, I didn't bring all of our statistics with us, but our, our budget's really split into three main groups. There, there's operating dollars and we pay for the bus service um, in addition to all of our capital uh, investments and ongoing um, operations and maintenance on our facilities. There's the personnel expenses, which like most divisions, personnel is one of our big ex biggest expenses. And then finally, um, the last piece is our debt. We're still paying debt on a number of our facilities, including parking structure number five, parking structure number seven, and six, two. So we still have a fair amount of debt. I think it's in the three and a half to $4 million range that we're still paying in terms of debt. Um, we do have a slight surplus each year that, uh, that we've been rolling in, in order to be able to fund um, future capital improvements. So there's a, you know, anytime you see a new parking lot come online, that's something that we pay for out of our budget as well. So. Um, like Andy said, you know, it's not that um, there's this huge surplus of money. The money is uh, parking and transportation is a self-funded division, so we don't get any resources in from the university um, as a whole or the administration. Everything that we put uh, that comes into the university's parking and transportation system goes back out in the terms of services, uh, resources, and facilities. Did they answer the question? I want anybody to uh, go away muttering under their breath that nobody's listening to them. This is your chance. Um, can we get a microphone in the back there? Uh, we're going to have to get a microphone to you. Hang on. Okay. If you close the Rose Street uh, uh, parking garage, my name is Steve Ellis from Physics and Astronomy. You're going to do away with our observatory. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's just a note, and I hope you've considered it. We, uh, we know that. And, and we're not going to blow up the garage. I'm, well, I, was, I, I didn't I mean joking. blow it up, but if you do close it. We're not going to take, it's not, it's not going to be taken down anytime soon. Okay. Lance just invested a lot of money in it to upgrade it. That, that garage is a fact of life. The second thing is you talked about Rose Street being made a pedestrian zone. Does that then uh, preclude using the Funkhauser parking and the library uh, road parking? No, no, I, I, I said what we want to do is find ways to uh, uh, manage traffic on roads and that one of the options would be to let people who have parking permits for those locations, uh, you know, if it was card operated, for instance, if there was a gate, that would be, you know, not the most attractive, but an easy way to control traffic, to keep general traffic out, but to allow the folks that, that uh, for whatever reason, you want to authorize to go down roads. And that's to say that, you know, a street that uh, is wide open for pedestrians and feels a lot like a plaza or a pedestrian mall can be, uh, can also handle a regulated and moderate amount of uh, vehicular traffic, particularly if those are the professional bus drivers, the people who have permits, for a particular place who know what zone they're getting into. What I would like to see is some, some solution that reduces the through sort of everyday, maybe not even university traffic on rows so that that isn't such a, uh, a barrier on campus. But it can certainly, you never really totally close a street. You just, you just have to manage who uses it.
two suggestions. Um, <clears throat> one would be uh, for the Rose Street parking structure, maybe some of the other parking structures, is a counter that uh, uh, keeps track of vehicles coming in and leaving so that if the parking structure is full, uh, you don't have people driving the whole way up and back down and then recircling, uh, trying to find parking spaces. Uh, and uh, that would save some time for a lot of people. Uh, second suggestion would be uh, uh, Woodland. Uh, there seems to be a lot of on-the-street parking there, and uh, uh, if that, I, I, I hate to say it, if that were to be eliminated, uh, you could increase the, uh, the flow of traffic on that street uh, with a possible turn lane uh, so that traffic uh, passing the uh, uh, stoplight at Woodland and uh, Columbia, Columbia uh, would be more efficient. A uh, couple of comments. Yeah, yeah, we'll be, uh, we will be looking at precisely those sort of things. We've already uh, had some discussions about taking off maybe a few parking spaces on Woodland just to improve the visibility for the new crosswalk from Woodland Glen. And uh, uh, there, there's, there's a traffic uh, a question to be solved about uh, the Woodland-Columbia intersection and how it relates to the, the Cooperstown Loop intersection and, and, and how that will, will sort of draw people through, through that little corner there. So yeah, we're very aware of that. On your first question uh, or comment, I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I've been flying so high here, I haven't talked about a lot of the things that we've been talking about as solutions. And there's a whole new world of technological opportunities out there. Um, what you talked about, the uh, uh, you know, variable message signs in front of garages telling you whether or not there's spaces, that's, that's old hat. What we can do now is iPhone apps that will tell you before you leave your house where, uh, how much parking is available at, at what locations. Similarly, uh, we already have, uh, is it next bus here? Uh, uh, the, um, Transloc, right for, for uh, uh, the, the CAT system where you can, you can see where the next bus is and, uh, and how long you'll have to wait. One of the things we want to do is maybe see if we can integrate UK system better with the Lextrans system so that you can, because Lextrans doesn't work quite as well. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things we can do uh, with, with smartphones to uh, help people know where, where to park uh, uh, and, and, and how to move around campus. So thanks for bringing that up. If you could collaborate perfectly with the Lexington Fayette Urban County government, what changes would you implement to improve safety and perceived safety of um, employee and commuter student cycling? Cycling. Well, um, I think I think that the, 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 the quick answer is. We showed you both the regional and the campus map, and there's a lot of gaps in those systems. Gaps of bike lanes, uh, off-street paths. Uh, it doesn't do you any good to have a bike lane for, for four blocks that just goes away. But uh, as we're seeing in Boston now, when we're finally getting serious about bicycling, um, when you start to create a comprehensive system <clears throat> where on any major street uh, there's either a bike lane that is continuous, that goes for miles and gets you where you want to go, or there's a parallel street that's quiet and bicycle friendly, and that becomes part of your network, then you've really done something. So um, that, that's sort of the, the general answer. A couple of specific issues that I know we, we have to deal with is the access from the south here. There, there's, a, there's a bike lane on this street, I believe, here, but you can't go through the Arboretum on it. So we need to find a way to connect around uh, uh, the old uh, uh, housing there and, and, and make that connection to the south. Limestone uh, must, be, must be a scary street to bike down. And uh, um, you know, that's a, that I think maybe has, uh, there, there, there may be more opportunity to look at sort of off-street parallel uh, bike boulevards. And a bike boulevard is a street that you can drive a car down, it's not restricted to bikes, but by means of traffic diverters and so forth, it's uh, more connected for bikes than for cars. And I think they're a great solution. So 
um, we, we will just, all I can say is we'll, we'll be looking at the regional level as well as the, the campus level when we talk about pipes. Yes, my name is Betty Thornton, and the reason why uh, I wanted to know, do y'all know when y'all going to get with Lextran about the transportation for the 530 people and the 330 people that do come to work early in the morning? They will be losing their service this Friday. So well, we're meeting with them today, and we will bring it up today. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's, not the, it's, it's actually sort of a breakout version of this meeting. So it's kind of to, to tell them about the transportation plan. It's not to sit down and, and lobby for, for anything in particular. But we will bring it up today. Uh, I'll, I'll tell them that we heard from two very concerned people uh, in the very first meeting. And, uh, and we'll take it from there. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, I don't know if there are any uh, representatives from the state, but we've heard often that they've refused to approve bonding to uh, create new structures, which seems to be problematic. So I just want to ask you a hypothetical question. If that bonding were approved, say, in an ideal reality, and you could get those structures built, well, what kind of picture would that create, do you think? Would that solve, would that allow for being able to solve a lot of the issues? Thank you. Well, um Another, another four or five hundred spaces uh, in a well-located uh, um, place would, uh, garage, would, would go a long way. I mean, as, as, as you saw from that occupancy map, if you go up to the, the uh, back east side of the stadium, you can find parking now. If we could move the blue zone, uh, you know, uh, red being full and blue being less full, a little closer into the campus, at least to make it um, uh, uh, so that the stadium parking is all really conveniently accessible to the bus. That would help a lot. Um, I'm not going to go into specifics. We have been talking about, you know, maybe where the next garage or next uh, uh, additional structure uh, uh, might be, but um, I guess I guess I can only sort of answer that and sort of that it, that it would help on the margin. Thank you, and I, I, I asked it hypothetical because I, I, I for one, uh, wish that the state would be willing to take on a little more risk in this regard. Um, I think it'd be a worthy investment, and you know, debts can be renegotiated, and I, I wish they would think of it in those terms. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh. Hi, I'm Peggy Phillips from the libraries, and I'm just curious about how often the parking structures are cleaned, because after big games, I've driven through glass, I've driven through computer parts, and have to complain every time, and I'm just curious how often they're cleaned. I can't answer that. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, athletic event parking, we, we turn that over turnkey to athletics, and athletics has a contract with a private entity that, that does the cleanup after the games. Um, if that's not happening, then that's just something that we need to be aware of. I know that um, the Rose Street garage, typically the Rose Street and the, and the Sports Center garages are the two that are the most difficult. Um, I'll speak with athletics and make sure they're putting an emphasis on it in the coming year. I, we do hear that complaint on a regular basis, so. Well. We could stay for another 10 minutes, but uh, if everyone's said their piece, I'm not going to say or, or forever hold it because we do have the website. We will have uh, another visit in March, and we will be, uh, at that time, rolling out some big ideas for you to respond to. Uh, um, it, it won't be, it won't be uh, uh, final at that point, even. Uh, we'll still want to hear. Uh, from you then, but after March, we're going to be moving into drafting recommendations. We hope to, to uh, uh, get this thing pretty much uh, uh, finalized by the end of the summer. Um, by the end of May, I think we'll have a pretty clear idea of what the plan is going to say. So uh, we are looking forward to working with you and, and really invite your participation uh, right up till then. Okay? Uh, unless anybody has anything else, uh, Lance, you want to say anything? Andy, would you mind putting up the slide with the with the address again sure. that folks can go to? to... 
Yes, there you go. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I know that uh, it takes a lot to get an hour and a half, an hour and a half out of anybody's schedule to come sit through anything, um, and we certainly appreciate any feedback that you all provide. Um, I know some people are, you know, hesitant to, in a forum like this, stand up and, and share their comments or concerns. But um, like Eric said and Andy, uh, Andy said through his presentation, we are actively seeking feedback and input. You know, um, we live in, and breathe this stuff every day um, and like to think that, you know, we, we have uh, good ideas and solutions. Um, but certainly we don't have the, we haven't cornered the market on it. Um, you all uh, park. One thing I always say about, um, about parking is very passionate, very personal. So you all understand um, your transportation and your, your campus access issues better than we do in a lot of respects because you're living it every day. Um, share that information with us. Go to the website if you, if you don't have any you know, public comments. Um, provide that to us. We'll certainly take that into consideration. One of the things we're really going to focus on is looking for trends among the comments too. If we see you know, comments that, are, that we're seeing a, a theme or a thread through, certainly those are things that we're going to really super focus on in addition to uh, making sure we address all the smaller issues as well. But again, thank you all very much for attending. We appreciate it. Yes.